While our guest today is widely known as Mr. Alter Ego with a Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Alter Ego Effect, a show on Fox inspired from his book, Alter Ego, and an Alter Ego shoe line with Brooks Athletics, he's also owned, he also owns two training companies operating in the worlds of professional sports and business performance. You might also know him as the creator of the program, The 90 Day Year. His partial client list includes Real Madrid, Boston Red Sox, the National Football League, the Danish Olympic team, and hundreds of other pro and Olympic athletes and teams. He's also the co-founder of UpCoach.com, which we're going to talk about a little bit. It's the world's first human transformation platform, helping coaches scale their programs, deliver transformational results, and manage everything in one place. He's been featured really everywhere, like NFL Films, ESPN, CBS Sports, The Today Show, Wall Street Journal, and some, what was that comedy guy's podcast you were just on? Burt Kreischer. Yeah, him, um, and hundreds of other media publications. He lives in New York City with his beautiful wife and three adorable children. I'm so happy that you're here. Welcome, Todd Herman. This is long overdue, and I'm stoked to talk today. Yeah, me too. Okay. So I first discovered you years ago uh, with your 90 day year program, which completely transformed my business. And I would say by extension of my life for sure. Um, and then I was lucky enough to coach with you in your base camp program. And recently at Ron Reich's event in San Antonio, we were both speakers. Um, mm -hmm. And when you took the stage, I was, you know, riveted as I always am when you take the stage. I don't know. You're really such a good speaker. Um, but what you talked about, again, has shifted my thinking in my business. You talked about your journey as a coach and, um, yeah. and really about the overall power of one-to-one -one coaching. Um, so I want to start there, like yeah. so your origin, your origin story as a coach has always been so inspiring to me that I have shared it with my own clients who are trying to get their first, you know, 10 clients. So can we start there? Can you tell everybody that story? Yeah. So, um, an important frame that I kind of place around my origin was I am very much an accidental I'd say accidental coach and then accidental entrepreneur. You know, I think there's a lot of stories that are told out there of someone being so deliberate, they had such a perfect vision or they had such a great vision for what they wanted to go and build as a product or a service. And then they went and they built it. And that, that wasn't mine at all. I, you know, played college football, started, uh, I love sport. I started coaching at a high school and then I, but I was spending more time talking to the kids about kind of the inner game side of their sport. And that was my strength. I, I'm not, I wasn't like physically gifted. I'm not six foot four and 245 pounds. And these kids started getting great results. But my, my method of kind of teaching them was I was teaching them more about kind of like just how the brain works. Cause I had fallen down that rabbit hole as a teenager. Um, and anyways, uh, these kids started getting great results. And this one mom came to me and said, Hey, would you mentor, um, my son? And I said, yeah, sure. And then there's this long pause. I'll never forget it. There's this long pause because I'm standing there awkwardly because I don't know what I'm supposed to say next. Right. And she's like, okay, well, how much do you want to charge? And I was like, in my head, I'm like, oh my God, what's the number? What's the number? What's the number? And I said, uh, how about $75 for three sessions? And she's like, done. And that was my rate for the first two and a half years from 97 to early 2000. That's what I charged. And what I learned was when you're super cheap, you get a lot of clients. <laughs> but for me, that was important because it, in retrospect, one, I'm very grateful for the fact that I wasn't growing up in a day and age where um, there's that there was this umbrella of get rich in coaching. Coaching wasn't an back then. I didn't have this pursuit to start charging thousands or tens of thousands of dollars before my competency was even ready to charge that amount of money. Um, and, you know, I was happy. Like I was, I loved sports. I loved working with teenagers and I, I busted my hump, but I busted my hump on a treadmill that I loved getting on every single day. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, there's lots of different lessons in that, 
but I stuck with that one-on-one coaching and I still do it today. And my message when we were at, both speaking at that event was, you know, there's a lot of different ideas out there about how if you do one-on-one coaching, you're trading time for dollars and shame on you and you should really scale everything up and, you know, whatever that might mean, whether it's with group or courses and, and I'm not poo-pooing any of that stuff, but um, you will never be someone who will ever find a transformational idea if you don't do one-on-one. And anyone can sit on stage with me and try and debate me all they want, but the alter ego concept, which as you said in the opener, I'm Mr. Alter Ego. That was never a concept that was widely known. It was never something that was an actual device that people deliberately used or talked about as a method to help people transform until I discovered it and was able to put the different pieces together because of the deep one-on-one work I was doing Mm -hmm. with not athletes in one sport, but working across 86 different sports. And so if you're someone who is racing in the coaching, consulting, service industry, whatever, to get out of one-on-one as fast as possible, hey, that's fine. But you'll never be the person who will be someone who finds a transformational idea or concept that will stand the test of time. And I'm not doing this to pat myself on the back. I'm really trying to cheer people on um, in realizing that there is extraordinary value and still doing a portion of your week, your month, whatever, doing one-on-one work. And you do not need to feel any sort of remorse or regret or feel bad because you're quote stuck inside. I love the people I get to work with. So, you know, kind of my posture back people is beat that because I coach some of the highest, most elite performers on the planet in many different industries. And their days or their weeks are not filled up necessarily doing stuff that they love. Some of them feel very trapped by the work that they do. Yeah, that's a good point. And when you when you gave that presentation and you sort of and you were talking about one to one coaching, yeah, I mean it is so true. Is that everybody sort of looks at it as a starting place, and that mm-hmm. the ultimate place you're supposed to get to to scale is the one to many model. Uh, let's create a course as soon as possible. Let's do group coaching, but God forbid we should, you know, quote unquote, waste our time just doing one-on-one. And it really cracked me open in a way that, um, I don't know, I needed at that time. And so I have, I have added some one-on-one spots, to my own business, and it feels so good uh, it feels so good to directly work with people again. I don't even know why, yeah. why couldn't I think of that? Well, the my, other, the other thing too, stuff. Jen is like when you're, I call it the field of play. Like, I mean, that's my vernacular. And my, my point about it is that when you're really on the field, helping people execute your idea or implement the thing that you're trying to uh, get them to implement or whatever the context is. When you're doing stuff in a one-on-one format, what it actually does is it allows you to transmute that experience into extraordinarily valuable content for other people because there's so much nuance found in that. And then that will be expressed differently in the content that you share, whether it's in a paid course or whether it's in a podcast or something else. That's the number one, you talked about Burt Kreischer, okay? So Burke Kreischer, you know, I think he had the number one movie on Netflix last year. And he's, he's, he's a favorite comedian of mine, not necessarily because I love his comedy so much, but he's a great example of people either love him or they absolutely despise him. You know, he's a comedian that takes his shirt off and he's got, um, you know, basically one story that massively blew him up. But on that podcast in the very first few minutes, um, it might've been in the first few minutes or was just a little bit after the introduction he shared, like when I heard you, I knew that this guy got it. And, and he was saying that from the frame of <laughs> celebrities, entertainers, singers, athletes that are underneath the white hot light of eyeballs of society. There is a very different level of strain, stress that's placed upon them that, average citizens just do not understand. And his point was, there were things that you were saying that only someone who's actually working with people at a very high level would even understand. And it came across in the way that you were sharing 
your ideas or stories. My point about making that isn't about me. It's more about when you stay close to the one-on-one -on -one, you know, battle that a real human being is going through implementing an idea, you're able to now show up very differently in a public setting um, where people go, oh, Jen gets it. Like there's something that's different about her. Whereas you can see it in the influencer space and the content, all, all they might actually share a really great idea, but it's typically pulled out of someone else's world to book or something like that. Now they repurpose it and they put a reframe on it and they call it something different. Happens to my book all the time, but there is absolutely zero depth. You ask them one clarifying question on it and all you're going to get back is a platitude. That's how you can, it's actually a, a, uh, a testing device that I use with people all the time to see if they actually have any depth of knowledge of something, just one clarifying question. And if they respond in a platitude, it's guaranteed that they've never implemented the idea. They haven't personally experienced the idea. And then they don't also work with someone else on the idea. Okay. I love that. Can you give an example of a clarifying question maybe that you've used recently or that, or that you might use? Um... Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, Hey Jen, I've, I've heard you talk about the importance of having basically a dashboard where all of the work um, needs to happen uh, for for the team. I'm, I'm wondering, what is it about that that's so important to the CEO? Ooh. Okay. okay that's just one it. simple one. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You know what the answer is for that? I can tell everybody. The, the purpose and the reason why any leader whether you're a one person show expanding with another person, the, the pain that someone is actually going through that gets expressed in being overbearing or controlling when they're giving up some element of responsibility inside their business, the actual need that's there isn't control. It's what everyone thinks that they're battling. No, it is not. It is that you are losing visibility and transparency into the actions in your business. And so the reason for the dashboard is to simply give visibility and transparency of, hey, where projects are, where the numbers are, are we moving forward? You know, is there anything that's slipping through the cracks? It's visibility and transparency. Because when you're the one person show, what do you have? 100% visibility and transparency into A, all the balls that you're dropping. <laughs> And, but at least you know that you're the one who did it. So well that's done. one of the reasons. Good answer, Todd. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my point is, is yeah. if someone doesn't respond with that or they go, they just respond with a platitude of, oh, well, I mean, it's what every business needs. Every business needs a dashboard. I'm like, okay, you don't know what you're talking about. Right. You don't know the underlying reasons why. When explained, I just did this um, uh, with a client in New Jersey, big wealth manager brought all of his leadership team together. And these are people who are highly competent individuals. They're actual COOs, you know, they're actual chief strategy officers. And I just asked them simply, why is it so critically important that we have this project management dashboard put into place? And, you know, there's lots of good answers, but when I explained it's because of visibility and transparency for everybody here. So, and da, 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 they were like, oh my God, that's so right. Because it also frames it in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's negative. It's not about controlling someone else. So anyway, it's just a quick, very quick example of clarifying something. Love that. Uh, wouldn't you say on that same vein, um, you know, with platitudes and surface level knowledge and, you know, being able to go so much deeper when you stay connected with your, with your folks by doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, don't you think, especially now, with AI, what is so often the trend is that the more uh, technologically advanced we get, the more we crave like analog, whatever that is, right? Like, like the handwritten note, the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And so I, I think having a human to connect with one-to-one, -one, because there is no shortage of information. There is no shortage no. of, you know, we, we all have access to the most brilliant minds. I could access your mind, you know, yeah. uh, in ChatGPT. I, I think maybe I have created a Todd Herman, like virtual coach for myself, <laughs> to be honest. I probably, I think I did. I think I did an alter ego. I took your book. I asked it to create, you know, Todd Herman coach. Cause you know, so now I can coach with you one-on-one, -on -one, but not really, of course, right? Like sure, to have sure. you 
completely, you know, completely different and that much more in demand, especially, you know, I think now is the time when uh, that the people who really know what they're talking about is really going to be evident. Um, the people who are truly, it already excellent. is, it already is. And there's already there, you, you already see pushback or commentary in some, in certain circles about that very thing. But, um, you know, like there's, I think COVID really accelerated for people, the critical importance of, you know, the human connection that zoom could only take you so far. Um, you know, the, I think the massive, simplification or minimalism that it's brought upon, you know, whether it's people buying up smaller properties um, in the woods or the mountains or the lake area or something like that farm um, is accelerated. But to your point that, that, that one-to-one -one escorting someone along, whatever the, the journey or the climb is, is in demand. In fact, I know from a mentoring so many people in this space of, you know, whether it's service delivery or um, coaching or training, whatever. And then also owning a platform that has now almost 6,000 coaching and training companies on it. The number one highest converting offer that is in the marketplace is a coaching type offer, which is why you have someone, the reason so many people are out there calling themselves coaches right now is because it's making them more money. As opposed to consultant or- A course creator, a course trainer right. or something like that. Because what's happened is courses have become more and more commoditized. It's like, you know, the, you know, to use a, a search term, it's like the long tail of of any sort of niche or market. It starts with generalization and then it moves into more and more specific. So like, here's a course on fitness. Well, here's a course on fitness for um, uh, people who, or for, for men, here's a course for men that are between the ages of 35 and 48. Here's a course for men who are between the ages of 35 to 48 that have desk jobs. Right, like that's that's actually a lesson in how you can actually break in and, and find a niche market right away um, for yourself. But because information is so ubiquitous, it is everywhere. It's the implementation and the accountability of transformation that people are are looking for right now. Which is, you know, I really think that we've moved into the transformation age. It was the information age, and now people are so bloated on information mm -hmm. that they're like, <laughs> enough of this. I want to transform. And that's yes. where the coach can insert themselves. And it's actually a very easy insert in my view, because it doesn't mean that you have to be so wickedly great at marketing. You just need to say like, Hey, in some markets, it's, are you kind of tired of just consuming the information and would like some support and help? Well, that's literally what I do. And I have a few different ways that I can help you do that. Uh, I want to, this is a perfect opportunity for me to insert uh, for folks to take a look at toddherman.me because I love your website. I meant to copy this when I saw it the first time. So I got to, I got to <laughs> do it now, but it says, it says, I don't have it in front of me, but it's like, I write, I coach, I teach. Do you, do you know it by heart? Yeah. It says I coach, I build, I write, I speak. And it's in that it's in a, it's in that form because one, I'm, more than just a noun, like some people would say, Hey, I'm a coach. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, and as the guy who is an expert on identity work, I use identity for my uses. I I'm very cognizant and aware that identity can trap people and we're more verbs than we are nouns. So that's why I say I coach because that's what I do. I coach people. And then what happens because I coach people still one-on-one -on -one to this day, I then take those lessons and I build products or I build another program around that. That's where nine of the year comes from. That's where up coach comes from. So I build something that can be leveraged for more people, but I'm watching that. I'm like, Oh, what's broken is, you know, are people still getting a great result that if I was coaching them one-on-one? -on -one? No. Okay. Well then let's iterate and let's improve that. Let's make that better. And then what happens is, well, after that process, then I write a book about it. You know, I wrote Alter Ego Effect not as a method for me to build my coaching business, um, 
because I wrote it 20 years after I started coaching, you know, and I'm not saying that I was the right way. Like I, I could have written it earlier, but I, I just wasn't done working with that concept yet until, okay. until I wrote that book. Okay, great. So, this is the And perfect... then I speak on it. Yes. And the, okay. So two things you just brought up. One, we have to loop back to. So I had made a note to myself because uh, I don't want to forget about this. And then I want to talk about the alter ego. Okay. Back to the beginnings. So you said 20 years ago, you started back to those early days when you charged that woman $75 for three sessions or whatever. Yeah. You also did something else to fill up your client roster. And it was so yeah. brilliant and so simple uh, that anybody could do that I love so much. So will you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, I, I'll say this. Anyone can do it. However, you're going to have your one way to go about doing it. Um, so I didn't know anything about marketing. <laughs> um, I wasn't a market. I wasn't a marketer. That's I still, that's not a moniker that I would ever, you know, ever think about myself. My business needs marketing. And so that's an activity that has to happen inside the business. Okay. Um, but I was like, I was, I wouldn't, I was like insecure about the idea that is this even a thing? Cause coaching wasn't an industry mental game, let alone wasn't this massive marketplace that was out there. Um, like it took some heavy lifting to convince people that mental game was like maybe a good, you know, part of the equation of developing this, you know, young athlete. And, um, and so I was like, is this even a business? Well, I don't know, but the one thing I do know is I know how to speak because I was a 4-H kid. So 4-H is like agricultural boy scouts to people that don't know. And when you're inside of a 4-H club, you always do a speaking competition in your club. And then if you win that, then you go to, you know, regionals and divisionals and state or provincials, depending on what country you're in. And when I was 10, so I started in 4-H and I happened to be good. I actually won um, my speaking competition, beat my brothers and, you know, everyone else in my club and kept on graduating up but I had really good mentors in my parents. So I was very comfortable on a stage. And I said to myself, listen, why don't I just do as many talks on this concept that I have around the triune athlete, the mentally, emotionally, and physically tough athlete, that when you align all three of those, you get the greatest chance of peak performance to come out of that athlete. Um, and so I knew two people, I called them up, Oh, and going back to that. So I had 90 days. I gave myself a 90 day window. I'll do as many free talks as I can. Um, one thing I did right, which was accidental, I price anchored it. I, Cause I told, I called up my friend, um, um, Eric and I said, Hey, I'm doing these workshops. They're like 90 minutes. Normally I would charge $2,200 for them, but I'm just trying to get my name out there more and I'll come in and I'll do it for free for you if that's okay. And he's like, uh, for sure. So I go in, I do this 90 minute workshop. And wait, on. and what was his role? In the so he was, sorry, Eric was um, the head of a, um, not a hockey association in Edmonton, Alberta, where that's where I lived at the time, but he was like a, like a hockey club type of thing. So okay. he had access and he, and he, and he had a lot of high level hockey players. Cause that's kind of where I started was hockey. Okay. And um, so that's what I did. And then I called up another guy. And he was the head of the association for um, St. Albert, which is a, like a bedroom community of Edmonton. And he did the soccer association. So I got these two people, so soccer. And um, so I went and did it. And I always ended my talk with, hey, oh, what I said was I'll do it for free, but only if one of the parents of the kids could be in the room. Because I knew that I had a terrible business. Because Jen, you're paying for my product, but you're not receiving it your kid is receiving the actual product. Right. Now you're receiving the, maybe the, you know, the glory of having a kid that's going to feel more confident. And that's if I actually do my job, right. Right. <laughs> you know, feeling more, you know, emotionally stable and stuff, but it wasn't. So I needed to get that checkbook because that's what lots of people paid me back then checkbooks. It wasn't swipe cards or it was a check. Um, um, mind you at 75 bucks, some people just gave me cash as well. So, <laughs> right. uh, so I needed, I needed that in the room. So here I am, I'm ending the talk and I would say to all the parents, I'm like, listen, I know a lot of you um, have other kids that are probably in sports as well, competing at a high level. I just want to let you know that I'm doing this free present. I'm doing this presentation for free until June the 13th. Uh, I think that was the the date, uh, June 13th. It was June 13th, 1998. And, um, and so if you want to come up and talk to me afterwards about coming out and I can come and talk to their team. And so that's how this kind of, 
quote, kind of viral effect started. And I ended up doing 68 speeches in 90 days. And that was in 1998. And I never had to market the peak athlete ever again, because I built such an inf- engine of referral and referability inside of not only that part of it, but also in the way that I onboarded and got clientele. Okay. Uh, the, what I love about this so much and the part of it that, um, the, the takeaway I think that is applicable to really anybody who wants to do something similar is the part where, um, the part where you can book, give yourself a goal. Like I love that you said, I'm going to, you know, get this number done in 90 days and that yeah. you set a goal for yourself. And, and, and I remember also you were like, sometimes there were four people in the room and sometimes there were, you know, 200 people in the room, but you showed up. My second, my second talk was I walked in, not, not, not just four people in the room, Jen. <laughs> um, it was after a youth hockey game. They were um, 13 year olds, 12, 13 year olds. And I came into their locker room because that's where we were going to do it. And I had my uh, crappy little Office Depot flip chart. And I say crappy because the one, the one of the three legs would always like it wouldn't <laughs> tighten anymore because I had kind of abused it so much. So sometimes in the middle of the presentation, like the leg would just fall. So anyways, <laughs> I had this um, flip chart that I would use. And as I'm setting it up, and I remember I had my back to the group, and again, they're just wrapping up getting all their stuff put into their bags. Um, I'm writing my name on it and triune athlete, the triune athlete. And uh, 13 of the 17 players um, walked out with their parents. Only four stuck around to, uh, to hear me talk. And um, I remember when I was just fitting, I was writing the A. I'll never forget it. I was writing the A in Herman, uh, the A-N part. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, I've won because I'm just as excited to talk to these four kids because I love this stuff as I would have been if everyone would have stuck around or if there was hundreds of people standing here. Like I, I could choke up because, you know, like I, you can get, you get so fortunate when you, when you find something that you really love speaking about or talking or sharing with people. And you also couple that with the the group of people that you love sharing it with. And you're also inside of a market or an industry that you believe in. I believe in sport. I believe in the power of sport. I believe in, I believed in very much working with young teenagers at that time. And I believed in this idea of the triune athlete. That's the other big thing as a takeaway for people that they miss out on is I actually had a concept or idea to share. I wasn't coming in and just saying, Hey, I'm going to, I want to talk about the mental game. I actually, unwittingly, again, I got fortunate in some way. I don't know how that idea came to my head, but the triune athlete, right? I, I had that and because then that became somewhat intellectually interesting for someone. Mm-hmm. And as someone who helps others develop their intellectual property now, like I, now I look back and I'm like, oh my God, like <laughs> you just happened to blindly swing at the ball and you, you cracked it. And, and so right. the that's, ultimate that's hook. the other thing to take away. You, What's you that? Had, you had the ultimate marketing hook. I mean, without doing, without creating a yeah. hook, knowing you were creating a hook, like you, you totally did. Yeah, um, I did. Yeah, and so I think you know you you put yourself in the room. You know what is it in Hamilton? I, I'm not going to sing it, but it was like I want. I wish I was in. I want to be in the room where it happens. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about that that yeah. song. So yeah. like you made the room where it happens. Like you created your own room, and I, I do think that if someone has something that they're passionate about, something that they know can help someone that they they really want to share, like why can't anyone do this? Why can't you know in their version of this? Like I'm going to give yes. myself 90 days. Like you don't have to have a fancy online funnel. You don't have to have mm-hmm. Facebook ads. You just got to get out there on the field to play. And Todd Herman speak and like, yeah, do it. Um, I love it. I love it so much. Okay. I, I, we can't, um, we, we, we can't go another minute without talking about the alter ego. Cause that's a whole other thing. And for those who aren't familiar with the alter ego, can you, can you catch us up? Yeah, sure. So, um, the alter ego was first coined as a phrase by Cicero back in 44 BC, and Cicero is kind of widely known as the greatest Roman statesman philosopher um, to live. 
in at least, if not the greatest, then one of the greatest. And he said in a letter to a friend who had asked him about, this is important. He asked him, hey, you've had so much success. Like basically what tips you got for me, right? So um, uh, DMs him back then. <laughs> and he's actually in a caravan. He wrote this while he was in a caravan going off to someplace else. And um, he uh, coined the term alter ego. And it means the other I or trusted friend within. And in the context of his note to a friend, he was saying how one of the Wait, things go that he back. Learned, the other, the other, the I? other I, uh -huh. the other I or trusted friend within that's what the alter ego really okay, is okay. in its pure form. It's, it's that trusted friend within whether you can have a conversation with, or it's that trusted friend or the other I that you're trying to move towards as a vision of the person you're trying to become, um, okay. or model in some ways. Okay. Got it. Um, and you know, it, but in the context of his note to the, uh, to the friend, he was like, listen, like what I've learned is that when, when I can shape shift my identity and these, I'm not, I'm sort of loosely translating when I shape shift my identity and I used it as my way of navigating the new challenges that I was always brought into, I was, I was able to achieve things much faster because I didn't stay stuck in, oh, Jen can't do that because she's from here or Jen can't do that because of X, we can all do that to ourselves. Um, and so in my discovery of working with people on the inner game, they would say things like, I've got a character, I've got this identity, I've got this uh, secret identity, I've got this alter ego, like all persona, they use all these different words. And for me, I was like, oh, I did the exact same thing. Like I had Geronimo when I played football. And you know, then when I was very insecure and lacked the confidence to really sell my fledgling little mental game business. I, cause you know, I, I didn't have eight letters behind my name because of degrees. I didn't have four best selling books. Three was actually the number. I thought you were became an expert when you had three best selling books. Like that was my stupid idea that I had way back then. Um, and I looked like I was 12 years old cause I had a baby face. Um, and it stopped me from going out there and trying to grow this thing. I wasn't telling people that I was the greatest mental game person in the world. I was working with teenagers and was pretty darn good at it because I was very good at building rapport with people, which is what m many people overlook mm. in the early processes of your business. And even in the later processes of your business, I've met phenomenal experts who have lost bedside manner. What if, I mean, don't you think a big part of your charisma you were born with? No, um, there's a lot of things that I've had to overcome. My brother is a very natural leader. I had to really work at my leadership skills. Um, there's certain elements of me that there are dispositions that we're all born with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but you know, I, the, I think one of the great visuals that I've, I've heard phrased before, you know, when someone comes along and there's this beautiful garden with tulips and daisies and everything is just gorgeous. And someone says, wow, isn't it amazing what God can do? And the gardener is standing there and says, <laughs> yeah, and you should have seen it before I came along. Um, <laughs> right. right? Yeah. So it's, it's one thing to have these dispositions. It's another thing to organize them and transmute them and direct the energy in a way that helps to get you results. I mean, there's still blind spots that I would have in the way that I show up in the world and we all do. But um, so my point being is, and, and charisma has nothing to do with caring. Here's what I learned early on, because there were some sports psychology people who would have been, quote, competitors who didn't give two shits about those young kids. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually care. I had amazing rapport with them because I wasn't that much older than them, but I genuinely cared. Like following up afterwards, you know, the day after a game, and a quick phone call and saying, hey, how did it go? Or, hey, did you do the thing that we talked about before? Closing feedback loops rapidly. You know, some people, they forget about the importance of that once they get to a certain level because their ego takes over. Mm -hmm. My point about that is that most people will look at the starting out stage as a disadvantage, and I really disagree. It's a disadvantage if you try to call yourself what I would now that I'm 28 years into my career. Um where you try to like posture with something that's maybe a bigger promise than what you can deliver right now. But there's a tremendous advantage that you have around being fresh and 
having like a level of like hustle to fight and prove yourself in many ways like that. Like I never want to lose that. I never want to lose that. And Which, I remind myself that of that every single day. Yeah. And also, also important to remember that that can happen at any stage in life. What you, you know, yes. you can pivot onto a new thing or reawaken your old thing or whatever, but how did your alter ego manifest itself at that time? Like what was, what was your alt? You said that, you know. Yeah. So Super Richard was the alter ego uh, for me. And, uh, you know, I take a look at the, so I have, a, I have a method that I talk about in the book. And um, for the sake of time, I'd, I'd say either go read the book or there's, a, <laughs> you know, other podcasts that people can go, you know, the, uh, there's other cool things that we can share here that I don't talk about on other podcasts as much because people do want to talk about alter ego. But for me, it was born out of, okay, so I'm, what am I not doing? I am not promoting this business. If I want this thing to, you know, break out, I, I, I need to get out of my own way. And every night I would make a bunch of promises to myself about making phone calls, you know, actual phone calls back then when you actually picked up a phone um, and I wouldn't do it. And in looking at it, I was, um, I just was insecure. I, I wasn't a very, I wasn't very good at communicating the value that I had. And I wasn't, I wasn't just taking, I just wasn't taking action. So in this, all this happened like very quickly in my head. I, cause I already played with mentors in my mind. I'm like, Oh, when it comes to being decisive, well, that's Superman, right? Man of action goes into the phone booth, comes out and, you know, saves the day. So that I'm borrowing that from him, Joseph Campbell. I fell in love with him in 1986 when he did the Bill Moyers PBS special about, you know, hero of a thousand faces and the hero's journey. And, um, you know, years later it ended up that I actually ended up being able to sit on the Joseph Campbell foundation board, wow. um, which was a very full circle hero's journey moment for me too. Right. Um, so he was my other, and that was about communication, his ability to articulate like really grand concepts, but in a, such an engaging way. So I wanted to be articulate like him. And then um, insecurity, I wanted to be confident like Benjamin Franklin. I mean, if there's a human being who reinvented himself over and over and over again, actually used all oh, alter egos as well and um, had tremendous careers multiple times in his life, well, I want that level of confidence. I mean, that was incredible to me. So that those became my trusted friends within, my models for how I want to show up. And then I went and bought a pair of non-prescription glasses and that became my cape when I put on those glasses. That's when Super Richard would take over and I would practice getting into that beingness and I would act my way into it. And then that's what I would do to make phone calls. It was Super Richard was hired to be the advocate for Todd's stuff. And I talk about this actually in the course, I talk about the importance of a very singular mission for the, why this hero was created for you. And because most of us have, many of us have aspirations and dreams. And for whatever reason, we have a hard time seeing Todd do it or someone like well, whoever that might be, but this person can do it. And so that person is coming in to take over that mission for you. And what happens is it eventually integrates into the self, like into you. And I remember about six months later, I I hung up the phone when you hung up phones <laughs> and I had just booked two speaking gigs for myself that were really big. And I looked down and my glasses were sitting on the table and I fought and I remember I slammed the table and I thought, aha, I finally became him. Wow. And so that was, that was, and that was in 1998 that I'd built the, or 798 when I built the super Richard, um, and then it was just so funny years later that I started seeing this amongst athletes. And I was like, wait a second, there's something else that's here. And my, that's going back to the earlier point that we were making about 101. Mm -hmm. I could have never found that concept if I just immediately scaled into workshops. Back then it would have been workshops or trainings because those, the nuances of the identity stuff was only shared in those quiet conversations, diving deep with people about you know, Hey, what's actually the thing that's helping you out there? Or, um, you know, just the, the nuances of those conversations. I, I, it's hard to get those things inside of group conversations. Um, 
back to coaching, what, what do you think yeah. the future is? Like, do you see, I mean, especially now that you have these insights, uh, that's, I'm super interested in that. Now that you have this amazing platform, which I want to hear about that as well of coach. Um, I guess, you know, you said you have 6,000 uh, coaches on there and, or, or 6,000 whatever. And the number one yeah. offer is a coaching offer. I'm curious about like what other trends you might be seeing that the rest of us wouldn't wouldn't have access to. Yeah, um, I I think one of the uh, one of the trends that you'll see is more um, intimate small uh, retreat type offers mm -hmm. doing very well. People traveling. I mean, it's already out there, right? Like people go, oh, okay. I'm like, no, you're going to see more of it um, as um, as a as a popular and accepted form of um, product, like from from clientele. Like they're like, oh, okay, yeah, I'd love to go and do something like that. Like very mm -hmm. experiential. Again, when you when you think about the umbrella here, is people really want transformation. However, you go and create that sort of environment, then it's going to be a, um, I think it'll be an offer for most people that will really do well. If it was a retreat where it's sitting inside of um, a room and taking notes all the time, that isn't going to be high converting necessarily, or something that will be talked about and referred. So that's one thing. I think that um, kind of like what you already, you're talking about having a Todd Herman AI version coach. Um, you're going to see more use of AI models to help you in navigating the, the coaching with clientele. Mm -hmm. Here's what I mean, um, is when you have your own concepts or you have your own cadre of, uh, influences, and then you feed it in, into some sort of AI algorithm. And then when Jen, you send me a question before I respond, maybe I'll put it through this. It, so this becomes a companion coach with you behind the scenes um, to help you maybe catch your own blind spots because it's that idea of the expert is at level 10. And then when they sort of try to demystify it, all they do is go down to a level eight and they forget about, you know, <laughs> the seven other steps that were there beforehand right, right. for the beginner. I think that companion type coaching behind the scenes, that AI, I think is very well built to, um, to augment that kind of uh, world as well. Um, and then I'd say the third thing is a real shift from synchronous coaching. Asynchronous coaching is already here, right? It's the idea of like, hey, you can vox me or you can send me a audio message or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I think in the marketplace, people will really accept it as maybe even the preferred form of coaching than over synchronous coaching. That 75% of the value I get from Jen is not based on whether or not we get on a Zoom call or we get on a phone call or we meet face to face that a lot of the value is in the ability to ping, ping someone at, you know, all times of the day or not necessarily that, but like more frequently asynchronously. I think those are, three I think that's big true. Trends. I think that's true because I think to be able to like ping you and be like, Hey, just quick question. Um, yeah. do you think this is a ridiculous amount for me to charge for X, Y, Z or, you know, whatever sure. the question yeah. is. Um, I do think people find that helpful. Do you see a median? I, this is probably not even possible, but is there like a, not, not a mean, but an average hourly rate you're seeing in your software, let people charge or. Uh, mm, no, because it's so all over the map based right. on the different industries. Um, they're in, I was just, uh, onboarded because this one client is a huge wealth manager inside of a, a major bank. And so our team had to jump through some different hoops in order for it to get approved because he wanted to pay with pre tax dollars anyway, not to confuse people. But anyway, when they were onboarding me, I was talking to their, you know, VP of 
you know, development, basically like a human resource person. And they said, I, I'm, I was excited to get on this call because you are astronomically more expensive than any other coach <laughs> or service provider that we have inside of um, uh, our system. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and she was expecting me to like explain that. And I love uh, that. And I was like, oh yeah, I know that. And I'm like, it's not expense. It's I'm astronomically more valuable than other people that you've got inside your platform. I love that. Uh, somebody uses the uh, like a big brand or somebody has a tagline, uh, reassuringly expensive or something. Reassuringly like that. expensive. Yeah, it's something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of, I mean, you deliver the. But hey, I've, but that. I mean, the way that I've, I mean, I've, I've, I've massively integrated that into my, my, my esteem. Like I earned it. I stuck. I, I stayed. At, I stayed at seventy five bucks for three. I stayed at twenty five dollars for a long ass time. But you know, it's really hard for people to beat me on numbers of reps. It's really well, hard how for do anyone you, who's been in the coaching space. How do you? How do you, Todd Herman, continue to grow? as a coach beyond your coaching sessions? Like what, what yeah. inspires you and fills Great you question. up? Great question. Um, so the first thing is goes, comes back to a mission that I'm on, which is I want to be the greatest coach that ever lived. I'm never going to get that award. I'm never going to get called up onto stage and no one's going to say that, but it's an idea that's in my head of that's how I want to be. And I hope on my final day, um, before I take my last breath, I've just hung up because I was just on a call with someone doing some, doing some coaching. Um, and most likely it'll be with my kids. But so that's, that's number one is the, is that idea. Like, I love it. I love, I love this vocation. And then, um, secondly, it surprised a bunch of people actually at the event that you were at when I had shared this. I, I still watch and have for two decades or listen, watch or listen to up to three hours of my own coaching every week. Ooh. And I'm, and because I look at it as the game film, right? Like I have a very sports performance approach to my world and how I, you know, look at, look at things. And well, you know, any great quarterback is going to come off the field and look at the game film and any, anyone else in any sport is going to look at that game film. And I, I'm listening for when did I, when did I, what was like a really good idea that I shared there that could be a piece of content. Okay. Um, cause sometimes you're, you're just on the field, you're just mixing it up. You're, you're coaching and you forget about that one really big takeaway, mm -hmm. or I'm watching for behavioral cues. I'm watching clientele. I'm like, Oh, there was something that Jen just did right there that I didn't pick up that she, so I'm going to follow up with her. And this is what gets clients ping. Imagine we have a call on a Tuesday, Jen, and then I ping you on a Friday and say, Hey, Jen, I was just thinking about our conversation. And when you had mentioned, um, some of the work that you're doing right now in building out a new program for yourself, I, there was something that you had said that I felt like maybe I missed or we missed there. And it was around the structuring of your curriculum. Am I imagining things or is there any, anything there? And I'm not saying negative or positive, right? Like in the languaging of things, I'm not, cause I don't want to lead you down a path. It's one of the worst things that we can do as, you know, coaches, consultants, advisors, moms, dads, whatever is create a presupposition that someone hooks onto mm -hmm. that's negative that actually wasn't there. Mm. Creating negative attitudes or beliefs about the self or whatever it is that they're pursuing that actually wasn't there. Um, because I need to take my position of authority in many of clients' heads and they go, oh, if Todd sees something that's there, that's a problem, then there must be a problem. Like, what's, what am I doing? I never even thought about that. Let me think about that. You know what, you're right. Um, I do feel insecure about my curriculum. I didn't say that. I don't, no, I don't want to say that you're insecure about your curriculum, right? So anyways, you saying that to a client, I'm telling you, is blows people away. Yeah, that's amazing. So that's, amazing. that's 
out of all the activities that I could do that improves myself, it's watching, watching my, uh, watching the game film of my coaching calls and I'm kind of grading it through a bunch of different, you know, lenses as I'm there. Fantastic. I, uh, I know that Jim Rohn is your eternal coach. Um, the teachings of Jim Rohn, like uh, that you, that you've mm -hmm. followed him. Um, and he's inspired you in your life, but do you coach with anyone in real life now? Do I still coach with anyone? Yeah. Like, oh, do yeah. you have yeah. your, like, does someone coach you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I would say there's no one, right. There's no one at this point in time that I'm paying to, to coach with. I have a couple of mentors that I'm working with that let's say I've coached them into being good coaches of me in some ways. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's cool. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's just, and, and more, it's a season of my life that I'm going through right now because of health stuff, um, that I just don't have the capacity to kind mm -hmm. of push very hard, um, in, in some domains, but absolutely. In fact, there was a, a season of my life back in the mid early 2010s where I didn't have a coach for about 18 months and I didn't even notice it, it was because two of my mentors had passed away, mm -hmm. um, Harvey Dorfman and Jim Rohn and Jim wasn't really coaching me anyway, not hadn't been for, uh, over a decade, but Harvey, I was very, very close with, and he's, you know, the legend of the mental game industry. And I didn't even realize that, you know, I kind of went through this gap in or valley of, uh, I, I just wasn't improving as much as I was in other years. And it was because I didn't have a coach. Um, I remember you talking about, uh, you had two practices that I remember. One was um, when you travel, you would pick up randomly, practically with your eyes closed, <laughs> pick up three, three magazines that you would never normally buy. Like, you know, yeah. uh, maybe it's Cosmopolitan, Mad Lib, not Mad Libs, Mad Magazine and Fisherman's sure. Digest, right? Like it would just yes. be so random. And then, uh, which yeah. I always thought that was so cool. And then the other practice you had, and I wonder if you still do it, is writing a letter every morning. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've done that f since the late 90s. You write a letter um, and you send the letter, right? Yeah. So I write a personal note um, and I've got my own letterhead and I've got, it's a, it's a box. It's just sitting up over there. Um, so I pull it out and it was a challenge early on from Jim actually Roan about writing a personal note uh, to people. And I, he didn't even put a timeline. He's like, just write a personal note to people, like write a personal letter. He did that. That was part of his practice. And, um, and so I, I wrote a few of them and I got a response to all three. Everybody responded back. So I'm like, talk about like a feedback loop that's closed. Right. So I just started doing that. And the way that I looked at it, maybe about a year into it is I'm using this letter as a way of, as an expression of gratitude to other people for some sort of way that they've impacted me. So a, an author's book, if I, and it's only a, it's only a one page and, um, and I so I have a, a certain structure that I have to it, but that's how I will kick off my day is doing that. And then on the magazine side of things, when I'm traveling, I don't just go to the uh, magazine shelf. I, I ask, cause I'm an extrovert. Um, I ask other people, Hey, do you have a favorite magazine or a random magazine that you pick up every now and then? And I'll make sure to ask people who, you know, you know, I would, my pr preference would be to say, ask someone who looks like she's a 75 year old, you know, grandmother or whatever, because maybe she'll, she'll definitely mention a magazine that I wouldn't think about. So, um, on my last trip back, um, you know, and this is last week I, I picked up a magazine. Um, is it cat fancier? It was a cat magazine anyway. Do you, and my, my point in, in what I've learned is that, Hey, if you want to stay interesting, um, then make sure your inputs come from lots of different areas. Secondly, some of your most innovative ideas are going to come from the random collision of, you know, concepts, ideas, topics, markets that have nothing to do with each other. And um, so I always, that's, that's just what I do. There's always something fascinating that I'll learn. Um, I just love the 
those two words together, random collision. I think I'm going to buy randomcollision.com <laughs> and see what happens right with ahead. it because that those two words are fantastic together. Um, all yeah. right, Todd. Well, um, before we head out, I want to hear about UpCoach. Like, tell us what it is, what it does. Yeah. What sure. is it? So, um, up coach, I've got two co-founders or three co-founders, um, in the software and, uh, two of us came together now four years ago, right at the start of that epidemic, which shall not be named. Um, and he's a very famous guy in the software and tech industry. Um, David Hensel built up many companies and he just started getting to coaching and he was like, and we had known each other for a long time. Um, and he's like, listen, I've got this idea and we came together, we talked and then we co-founded up coach and we started building up this platform. And there's so many different learning management systems that are out there, but there was nothing that was really built for the industry of coaching, which there's, there's like one-on-one coaching type platforms out there. But what happens when you want to add some leverage into your business, like group coaching, mm-hmm. or you want to add courses and trainings? Now you've got these different things. And so that was the vision was, I want to build a platform that's great for doing one-on-one coaching and then also helps to support people as they want to add more leverage. So you can do group coaching and communities inside of it. Um, and you know, you can also, there's a lot of accountability tools in it where you can help to, um, keep your clients accountable with like tasks or projects that they might be working on or helping them to track their habits. And, uh, so anyways, it's a beautiful platform. I'm super pumped about it. And I, my favorite testimonials that we get is from people who are, who've been coaching for a while. And this one lady I'll never forget, she's had an incredible career in the world of uh, corporate America. And she's like, I've been coaching for eight years. And I thought that maybe I'm not bright. Like maybe I just can't figure, like why, why can't I figure out how to put more leverage into my business? And the moment I put all of my one-on-one coaching inside of UpCoach, immediately I saw exactly how to add group, cohort, all this kind of uh, stuff. And now she's making even more of an impact with more people. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, we've been doing it for four years. For two years, I had it shut down, meaning only I was, because I was battle testing it. And then we took it out to the market. I invited people in and now it's kind of open season for everyone to come in. Is there a free trial of it? Can people we have, try it if, if if you go, if you go to our pricing page mm-hmm. um, and we can set up something on the back end too, maybe not, because I can't give you the exact code right now, but sure. on your podcast page, if someone goes to Jen's site, we'll get, we'll get a special code for people to do um, a, uh, a $1 for your first month for you to kick every single tire that you possibly can. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I really wasn't fishing for that. I just was curious <laughs> if it have, had that, you know, like the free month built in, but also that's a super. Well, listen, great. don't, don't deny the fish that just jumps inside the boat. I'm if you not, weren't fishing for it. <laughs> I shall not. Um, well, Todd, this is, well, okay. Last question. What are you excited about? Like, what are you like really super excited about right now? I'm, I'm really excited about all the different, um, coaching that I get to do every single, like, I just, I still like, I mean, I don't, maybe I'm boring, but I'm very excited about the work that I just get to do every single week. And I'm excited about the clients. Um, I just was just messaging before we got on the, this, this particular interview with a client who's in one of our mentoring programs, um, with just like a massive personal win that they had with their, with their daughter. Um, and something that we encourage them to go out and do. So I'm always more excited about what other people are doing than typically. Yeah, my own I get that. Um, all right. Well, I don't know if you know it or not, but this was like a huge, huge thing for me to have you on this podcast. Um, I'll try not to get emotional, <laughs> but you've made a huge, big deal a big difference in my life. You've been a, an amazing mentor to me and, uh, and I still continue to follow you, um, and see what you're up to. And I'm, I, I continue to be inspired by you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Jen, I, I love you. Well, the thing that's easy to love about you is that it's so obvious that you care 
Um, I'm, I feel very fortunate that I get to have people who find me through you and they send all of these amazing messages about how much of an impact you make on their lives. And so, um, well, I'm, I'm grateful to be here and grateful for the chance and, um, it's always great chatting. Thank you.